welcome back for this last session of the conference, which is the keynote lecture by Barbara Rossi. And now anyone who has ever done any macroeconometrics forecasting or time series analysis knows Barbara's work, but this is a highly interdisciplinary conference. So let me give uh, just a brief introduction. Barbara Rossi is professor of economics at Pompeu Fabra University. She was previously associate professor at Duke University after earning her PhD at Princeton University. She's a fellow of the International Association of Applied Econometrics, a fellow of the Econometric Society, a CPR fellow, and currently serves as director of the International Association of Applied Econometrics. Uh, instead of listing the numerous top journals Barbara has published in, and there would be too many anyway, I would like to tell you that she's not only a world-class scientist, but also a very nice person. I'll tell you this one anecdote. <laughs> years ago, when I was still a PhD student in macroeconometrics, by the way, Barbara was a role model for me. She, a woman, a young woman, and already so successful in exactly the same field as, as mine. So I happened to attend the ECB forecasting conference where only Few, very few top econometricians would be invited to speak. And Barbara was, of course, invited, and she had flown from the US to give this talk in Frankfurt. Well, at the conference reception where I had sneaked in, uh, it, with, with all these big names walking around, well, she found the time to sit down and talk to me, a nobody. And I can still remember her words, and I will tell you. Um, so, Barbara, it is indeed a great pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, before giving you the floor, let me just remind the audience that questions are very welcome. Just please use the uh, Q&A uh, functionality. Uh, Barbara, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction, Lucia. I don't know if I deserve it, but uh, thank you so much. And thank you also to Claudio for, uh, you know, both of you for organizing such a, an excellent uh, conference and uh, uh, allowing me to, uh, to be part of it. Um, so uh, let me start by sharing my uh, screen. Uh, we should uh, show up uh, uh, shortly. Um, it's coming up uh, now. I hope you can uh, uh, see it. Yes, yes. We yes, can. okay, yes. excellent. So uh, the paper I would like to uh, present today uh, is uh, about uh, uh, monetary policy, in particular the information channel of monetary policy. So what we do in this paper is that we revisit the empirical evidence on the so-called information channel of monetary policy, and in particular, we investigate uh, whether it disappeared over time. Uh, this is joint work with uh, um, two kind of students of mine. One is uh, Tatevik, who used to be my student when I was at Duke University many years ago, and we kept collaborating uh, since then. And the other is uh, Lucas, uh, who is uh, my PhD student for another couple of months uh, until he graduates and uh, flies away. Anyway, so let me tell you a little bit more about uh, the information channel of monetary policy if you don't know, uh, if you don't know about it. So where does the literature on the information channel of monetary policy starts? It starts from uh, some uh, interesting empirical results uh, in a series of papers by Campbell and others that found that in response to unexpected increases in real interest rates uh, due to monetary policy, that is uh, in response to an unexpected tightening uh, in monetary policy, survey so estimates of expected output growth arise. And uh, this is puzzling. Uh, this is a puzzling empirical finding because uh, this is contrary to economic theory, according to which uh, after a contractionary uh, monetary policy shock, uh, you should see a decline in output. Now, the information channel is, in fact, uh, a theoretical explanation for this uh, puzzling empirical finding. And uh, uh, the information channel monetary policy was developed in a series of papers by, a uh, very nice series of papers by uh, Leonardo Melosi and Nakamura and Steinson, and was also investigated by Lunsford, Chislak and Schrimpf, uh, Paul and Bauer and, and Swanson. Okay, but what is this uh, information channel and why does this uh, information channel resolve uh, the puzzle? So according to the information channel of monetary policy, the central bank communicates not only uh, information about uh, the future monetary policy, but also how optimistic it is about uh, the state of the economy itself. So in other words, uh, if uh, the central bank expectation of uh, future fundamentals is different from the state of the economy, which is perceived by the market participants, then the market participants 
after hearing uh, uh, news from the central bank, they will update their expectations about the state of the economy. So one of the consequences of the information channel, therefore, is that uh, in re the responses to a monetary policy shock may not be estimated correctly. Okay, so think about this. So typically, right, after an unexpected monetary policy tightening, you should uh, see a negative response of output and inflation. And this will happen when uh, monetary policy is indeed uh, uh, announcing that they will impose uh, a tightening. However, if the monetary policy tightening is the result of the central bank endogenous reaction to a future state of the economy which is more positive than the market anticipated, then uh, the announcement signals and anticipates uh, a positive response of output and inflation. And that's what you may find in the data. So the econometrician may find either a positive uh, or a negative response, depending on whether uh, the information channel is present in the data. Okay. So what do we do in this paper? Well, in this paper, we investigate the information channel together with uh, uh, another, what we think is another very important concept in this uh, literature, which is the information advantage of the central bank. So we start from the uh, realization that uh, uh, a sufficient, uh, although not necessary, condition for the existence of an information channel of, this, uh, of, uh, of, of monetary policy is that the central bank has an information advantage relative to market participants. What do we mean by information advantage? We mean the situation where the central bank has uh, better knowledge on the state of the, on the current and future state of the economy. So in other words, the central bank is better at forecasting uh, the uh, current state and the future state of the economy relative to market participants. Why would they be better at doing this? Well, maybe they have uh, access to uh, private information. Uh, maybe they employ better forecasters. Uh, whatever it may be, that's the assumption behind the information channel, that the central bank uh, has an information advantage relative to market participants. So uh, we think that uh, um, uh, a sufficient condition for the existence of an information channel is uh, the existence of the information advantage of the central bank. Why is that the case? Well, because uh, central bank uh, announcements, when the central bank has an information an, uh, advantage, central bank announcements will indeed provide the novel information to the market participants, uh, which, will, which uh, they will use uh, to update uh, their expectations. So before I move on, uh, let me stop for a second, um, because uh, in this paper, there will be two important concepts. One is the information channel of uh, uh, monetary policy, and the other is the information advantage of the central bank. And I would like to uh, uh, make sure that uh, uh, you understand the difference between the two, also because they both uh, have the term information in there. So it's easy to get confused between them. And I might get confused as well at times. So the uh, information channel of monetary policy by the information channel of monetary policy, we mean the situation where the central bank communicates not only uh, news about monetary policy, but also uh, their knowledge, their private knowledge about the state of the economy. Whereas uh, by the term information advantage of the central bank, we mean uh, the situation where the central bank uh, is better at predicting the state of the economy. Okay? So uh, our uh, working assumption is that uh, uh, the information uh, advantage of the central bank is a sufficient, although not necessary, condition for the information channel. Okay? It's not necessary because uh, uh, there are theoretical models according to which it is still possible that the central bank and the market participants coordinate on some equilibrium, uh, which uh, uh, it is not related to, it is not due to the fact that uh, the central bank has an information advantage. Okay? Uh, so this would be the papers by Morris and Shin. But it is reasonable uh, to expect that the information uh, channel of monetary policy might be present, in fact, if there is an information advantage, if the central bank indeed has something to, to tell the market. Okay. So, uh, so what do we do in this paper? Well, in this paper, we take the information channel uh, uh, seriously and we investigate uh, its importance, uh, uh, its empirical importance. So we ask uh, uh, two questions. We ask whether the Federal Reserve uh, has an information advantage in forecasting macroeconomic variables beyond what is known to private forecasters, and whether this matters for estimating the response of the economy to monetary policy shocks, uh, because as we said, as we said uh, the information advantage may lead to an information channel of monetary policy. So now what is the special feature in our paper? Uh, 
but the special feature that distinguishes this paper from uh, previous papers in the literature, there is a huge literature on these topics. Um, the, our peculiar feature is that uh, um, we revisit the empirical evidence uh, paying a particular attention to uh, the presence of instabilities. So this is a crucial departure from the existing literature that instead assumes uh, that uh, the data are stable. Now, what I will do is uh, uh, to convince you that this is indeed a, a worthwhile enterprise. I will first try to convince you that instabilities are an important empirical feature of the data. Uh, and uh, in fact, we will allow uh, the Federal Reserve and the market participants uh, to systematically over or under predict macroeconomic variables, as well as uh, the relative forecasting performance to change over time. So now what is it uh, that we will find? Okay? Uh, so if you have to run to, uh, to your next meeting and you don't have to, time to stay with us uh, for another 45 minutes, uh, you will already have the results. So what we find is that uh, um, in the most recent period, the, the Federal Reserve, the central bank in the US, lost its forecasting advantage regarding the state of the economy relative to market participants. So the central bank uh, had an information advantage in the past. They were better at predicting the state of the economy. But uh, uh, recently, starting the mid 2000s, they, they lost this information advantage. At the same time, exactly at the same time, the information channel of, of monetary policy also disappeared. So again, the information channel was uh, uh, very clear, uh, very clearly present in the data before 2003, 2004, and then uh, disappeared around the same time as the forecasting advantage disappeared. So this, uh, these findings suggest that the information channel of monetary policy and the uh, information advantage of the central bank are indeed tightly linked. And we will offer some uh, explanations for why uh, uh, that is the case and why both disappeared around the same time. Okay. So now what I will, uh, the, the way I plan to, uh, I plan this talk is uh, to discuss the two uh, main questions separately. So first I will start by investigating uh, the information advantage, whether the central bank has an information advantage and uh, whether it has uh, this information advantage has changed over time. So um, how do we test uh, the information advantage? Uh, we will follow the very nice paper by Roman and Roman in 2000 uh, and run the so-called information advantage type of regressions. What is the information advantage type regression? Well, uh, you would regress the forecast error, the forecast error uh, in uh, uh, private sector forecasts onto the forecast of the central bank and the private sector forecast. So the X T plus H is the realization of a variable uh, H periods into the future from time T. So think of it as a GDP, inflation, whatever you prefer. Now, this is the realization, and we will compare the realization with the forecast that was made by the private sector. In this case, uh, in our paper, the private sector is, the, uh, is represented by the blue chip, the consensus forecast. Okay? And is denoted here by XT plus H given T, BCE for blue chip. So this uh, variable that you see on the left-hand side is the forecast error of the private sector. So you regress the forecast error of the private sector onto the forecast of the central bank. So X T plus H given T G B is the forecast of the central bank, or in our case, the green book forecast in the US. And as well, the forecast of the private sector. So if the central bank has an information advantage relative to private market participants, then you should observe that the beta G B is different from zero. You should observe that the forecast of the central bank is able to predict, is able to improve the forecast error of the blue chip, okay? So uh, therefore, if beta GB is different from zero, then that's when the central bank has an information advantage. And this will be this, uh, uh, this uh, analysis will be the, uh, um, uh, the important part of, of our paper, an important part of our paper. We will be testing whether beta GB is equal to zero or, or not. So we will consider uh, forecasting several target variables. Uh, in the paper, you will find uh, inflation, GDP growth, unemployment, interest rates. Here, I will focus mostly on uh, one variable. Sometimes it's GDP, sometimes it's inflation. Um, and the most important uh, uh, point that I would like to make here is that uh, typically these regressions are estimated assuming that uh, the variables are stationary. So, uh, however, uh, while the traditional test assumes stationarity, the data are not, uh, in fact, stationary. And let me try to convince you about that by showing some, uh, some pictures. 
So um, in this picture, you see inflation, realized value of inflation in the US between the 70s and the 2000s. So in, in blue, uh, I report the actual realization of inflation over time. Uh, and then together in the same picture, I report uh, uh, forecasts uh, made by either the central bank, uh, denoted by green book and depicted in green, or the forecast by the blue chip economic indicator depicted by black dots, or forecast by another survey uh, data, which is the SPF. So um, now what you see here is that uh, the forecasts are very highly correlated, right? So the uh, green, the black, and the red line are very much moving together, uh, and they are co-moving a lot. Uh, and somehow, they, uh, while they co-move a lot with each other, they uh, somehow do not track uh, always uh, the actualization very well. So in fact, you see that there are periods of time between uh, uh, the 70s and the 80, 80s, period of times in which uh, uh, you observe a substantial forecast error. So you observe that the forecast, uh, all the forecasts are under predicting inflation. Okay? So you see uh, a big uh, positive forecast error if the, por if the forecast error is uh, uh, defined as uh, the realization minus the forecast. Okay? Now, so in the, between the 70s and the 80s, and um, sorry, in the 70s, you see mostly uh, a bunch of uh, positive forecast errors. After 1980s, you start seeing the opposite. You start seeing a bunch of negative forecast errors, right? You start seeing situations where the forecasts are in fact bigger, uh, higher than the realization. Now, the econometrician that would look at these uh, forecast errors would conclude that these uh, um, inflation forecasts are in fact fine on average. Fine because the forecast errors are on average equal to zero. These uh, positive forecast errors that you see over here somehow uh, balance the negative forecast error you see in the second part of the sample. And if you take the average of the forecast errors, the average is actually very close to zero. However, even if uh, on average, the inflation forecast look fine, the average forecast error is zero. In fact, these forecasts are uh, making very persistent and systematic mistakes, okay? So in fact, the mean of the forecast error is uh, uh, positive here and is negative over here. And this is what creates uh, non-stationarity. The mean uh, of the forecast error changes over time. From positive, it becomes negative. And this is uh, uh, the cause of the instability in the data. Um, so this means uh, that the forecast errors that we typically use uh, in the forecast advantage uh, type of regressions are non-stationary and therefore uh, these uh, coefficients uh, are not estimated consistently. So you have to be very careful in uh, running this regression and interpreting these results. So what is it that we are going to do? Well, if uh, the usual T statistics cannot be used because uh, uh, there are instabilities in the data, uh, we will need to resort to something else. And in this paper, we resort to um, a different type of test, which is the fluctuation test that we developed with, uh, with Tatevik in a previous paper. Uh, so this fluctuation test can be adapted to evaluate the information advantage. And uh, um, uh, we will call the use of the fluctuation test in this context as the information advantage fluctuation test. So um, now the information advantage fluctuation test is a test that is robust to instabilities because it is repeated in rolling windows over uh, the sample. So the fact that it is repeated in rolling window the, over the sample allows the test to follow the, uh, the time varying performance of the information advantage uh, locally over time. So uh, in that case, and therefore makes it robust to the presence of instabilities. So in other words, uh, uh, our goal is to estimate the same regression you saw before, the information advantage regression, but uh, uh, being mindful of the fact that these coefficients might be changing over time, in particular, the beta GB coefficient that we're interested in. Okay? So we will therefore test the null hypothesis that beta GB is equal to zero at every point in time. And uh, uh, we will do so by, uh, doing, by using the fluctuation test. So what I will show you in a second is how this uh, fluctuation test uh, uh, is constructed, if you've never seen it uh, before. Right, so I've presented this paper many times. Uh, and also the paper with Tatevik was presented many times. So maybe you have seen it before. Uh, maybe you're all bored by this fluctuation test, but if you have never seen it before, here it comes, okay? Um, so how does the fluctuation test work? So let's think about uh, how the data are generated. 
first. So the uh, forecaster, let's say the forecaster uh, sits at time R and produces a forecast, okay? Produces a forecast H periods into the future. Associated with that forecast, uh, there will be a forecast error, which is the difference between the realization and the forecast. And I will denote the forecast error by E. So, um, so associated with the forecast that was made at time R, there will be an associated forecast error uh, that the econometrician can then evaluate. Then uh, uh, a new observation becomes available in real time. The forecaster reestimates the parameters in its model, produces another forecast, and gets another forecast error. And uh, so on and so forth, uh, as data uh, keeps coming out, uh, there will be um, the, the forecaster will produce a series of forecasts, and the econometrician will observe uh, a sequence of forecast errors over time. Now, at the end of the day, the forecaster will, uh, uh, the econometrician will observe a series of auto sample forecast errors that you see here in this, uh, in this plot. Now, the typical procedure in the literature is to estimate uh, this uh, uh, information advantage regression uh, by simply taking all these observations, plugging them in here on the left hand side of this uh, regression, and then uh, uh, test whether beta is equal to zero using a simple t test. Okay, so you would do a t-test using the whole sample. But the problem here is that uh, the data are not stationary. The mean of the forecast error changes uh, depending on the subsample you look at. And therefore, this test will give you uh, bad results. Okay? So you cannot use the usual t-test to evaluate the information advantage. Uh, however, you can use the fluctuation test. So how does the fluctuation test uh, work? You choose a window of data. In this case, uh, uh, it's m. You choose a window of m observations, and uh, within that window, you obtain a t statistic. Then you roll uh, through the sample, sorry, you roll through the sample, uh, again, taking uh, the next window of m observation and get another t statistic. And then you keep doing so until you get a sequence of t test statistics. This uh, sequence of t test statistics allows you to, uh, to follow the performance of the information advantage over time. And that's what makes you robust to the presence of the instabilities. Now, the fluctuation test itself has to condense the information across this sequence of t-test statistics into a statistic. Uh, and so the fluctuation test will be constructed as the largest value across the absolute value of the sequence of the test statistics, of the t-test statistics. Okay, so the fluctuation test will be the largest value across the sequence. But uh, the time sequence, the sequence over time of the T statistics is also informative. And that's what I will show you in the next pictures. Um, now, so what you will see therefore in the next pictures are the um, plots of the sequence of the T test statistics over time. The fluctuation test, remember, will be the largest across the sequence. And the, uh, our job in the paper with the TATEV was to propose this uh, uh, fluctuation test and its critical values because it's a repeated test over time. And you need to have uh, some special critical values. So here is the uh, sequence of the T statistics over time uh, in four cases. So what you see in these pictures are um, forecast of inflation on the left hand side and uh, forecast of GDP growth on the right hand side. Um, we look at different uh, forecast horizon, either the nowcast uh, on the first row or the uh, one quarter ahead forecast in the bottom uh, row. Uh, either way, each of, in each of these plots, uh, you will see a black line. The black line is the sequence of the t-test statistics okay, over time. Uh, remember that the fluctuation test will be the largest value in absolute value. So in this case, the fluctuation test will be this point over here. And the red lines in the same picture report uh, these uh, adjusted critical values that we worked out with Tatevik to test, uh, to, to complement the fluctuation test, to implement the fluctuation test. So now what do we learn from this picture? Well, when the blue line is outside the red line, um, you conclude that the, there is evidence against uh, the fact that beta is equal to zero. So, when the black line is outside the red critical values, it means that there is an information advantage. So there is a strong evidence, therefore, of an information advantage in uh, um, the nowcast of inflation and uh, in the nowcast say, of GDP growth in the early part of the sample. But you also see that this evidence 
somewhat deteriorated over time. And in fact, you see that, uh, uh, at least in the case of inflation outcast, that there was a, an abrupt uh, decrease uh, in the uh, sequence of these statistics. And this happened around uh, 2003, 2004. Uh, same thing for real GDP growth forecasts. Again, 2003, 2004, you see a big, uh, you see a drop in the, um, in the information advantage, in the presence of the information advantage. Similar results for one quarter ahead. Uh, again, there is a big drop. Either it happens before or it happens again at around the same time. Now, um, these were, what I showed you were short-term forecasts, either an outcast or the one quarter ahead. Uh, let me also show you what happens uh, in longer term forecast because the picture is slightly different for long term forecast. When you look at the average of uh, two to four quarters ahead forecast, again for inflation and uh, GDP growth, you see similarly that uh, there is no information advantage in the later part of the sample. Either it was never there, as in the case of GDP growth, or it disappeared uh, even a bit earlier. Okay? Now, the fact that uh, the Fed lost its information advantage in long-term forecasts is not a new finding in the literature. It was already pointed out in a very nice paper by D'Agostino and Wieland. Uh, however, the fact that uh, the central bank lost its short-run information advantage is a new finding in the literature, and that's uh, what we are contributing in this, uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this paper. So why then has this information advantage disappeared? And some, some intuition for why the information advantage disappeared that can be uh, obtained by looking at the interest rate forecast. So let me show you now the um, sequence of the t-tests for predicting uh, interest rates either at the one quarter ahead or at the two to four quarters ahead. In both cases, you see that uh, um, the information advantage type regression, the t-statistics, uh, were significant, again, in the first part of the sample, but there was a big drop uh, in the significance, again, around the same time, around 2003, 2004. So the, uh, we are, what we argue in this paper is that the disappearance of the information advantage uh, is that it might be related to the Fed forward guidance that was uh, started around the same point in time, in 2003, 2004. So what happened in 2003, 2004? Well, you might remember uh, Ben Bernanke started the... Uh, um, uh, several, to make several changes in the uh, central bank uh, communication policy, started uh, uh, informing the market about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, started sharing with the market important information about the uh, central bank monetary policy, started becoming more transparent. And uh, this, uh, because the central bank started sharing more information, uh, that's why it might have actually lost this information advantage, right? So then uh, by communicating this information to the public, uh, the public became as good as the central bank in forecasting, and that's why the information advantage disappeared. Now, the regression that you saw uh, are based, or the empirical results that you saw are based, uh, uh, that you saw are based on a variety of assumptions. So let me open a, a small parenthesis of technical notes, uh, as you might ask the question why uh, or how, uh, how robust are these results to the assumptions that we're making. Um, so we use uh, uh, the first time realization, the, sorry, the first uh, uh, release of the realization of the uh, macroeconomic variables. Uh, in the literature, some people use the first release, some people use the second or the third release. It doesn't really matter. Our results are robust to using uh, either of those. Now, another assumption that we have to make in this paper is uh, the choice uh, uh, of the rolling window uh, to implement the fluctuation test. So in this paper, um, we show that uh, the choice of the rolling window doesn't really matter. The results, the empirical results of the disappearance of the information advantage are, are robust to using a variety of uh, window sizes. Um, the results are also robust to using different procedures for matching uh, the green book and the blue chip uh, uh, forecast. What do I mean by this? Uh, what I mean by this is the fact that uh, the regressions that you saw, um, in the regression that you saw, T, the point in time, was uh, the so-called meeting uh, frequency time. So these regression are run uh, using observations that coincide with the uh, uh, meetings of the uh, FOMC, uh, um, of the central bank, uh, FOMC type of meetings. So um, therefore we need to match, we need to match information from the green book, the forecasts that were made by the central bank prior to those, uh, uh, prior to the FOMC meetings, we have to match those with the forecast of the private sector. 
there are different ways in which you can match those, uh, and our results are robust to, uh, to the way we match, uh, we match them. Now, um, you may say, well, Barbara, you could do other types of tests. Uh, you could, for example, look at uh, um, relative uh, root mean square forecast errors, directly comparing the forecast errors of uh, uh, the private sector and uh, the green book uh, using root mean square forecast errors. Uh, well, the results are robust. You will similarly see a, a decrease uh, uh, in the root mean square forecast error of the uh, blue chip uh, uh, in the 2003-2004, becoming it more and therefore becomes more similar to that of the central bank. Um, now, another thing that you may say, well, Barbara, you are talking about uh, a break, a disappearance uh, of the information advantage. Well, then why don't you then use also a test for structural breaks? Right? So what I showed you are tests based on a fluctuation test, which is uh, smoothing uh, the information in rolling windows over time. And you may say, well, maybe this smoothing um, is uh, not giving you a right estimate of the point in which there is a disappearance of the, uh, of the information advantage. Maybe you want to investigate that with other tests, uh, for example, structural break tests. And we have done that uh, in the paper. This is the mo most common question that I get uh, uh, when I present this paper. So, uh, I want to share you the, uh, I want to share with you the results of this test. So this in, uh, this in fact, uh, this slide in fact uh, shows you the results of the Bayern Peron multiple discrete break test statistic. I just show you the results for inflation uh, now cast one quarter ahead and the uh, sort of uh, medium run uh, forecast. Um, so what you see in this uh, uh, table are estimated break dates, uh, are the estimated break dates. Uh, in this regression. So the, the Bayern Peron test estimates uh, uh, potentially multiple structural breaks. Uh, here they are, the, their estimated values together with the uh, confidence intervals. So the good news uh, from this table is that even if I use uh, the Bayern Peron test, I still find uh, that 2003, 2004 kind of is a, a robust uh, break date. Okay? So the Bayern Peron test finds a similar, uh, a similar break date. Now, you have to be careful, however, that the Bayern Peron test is a test for a structural break. It's not a test for a, the disappearance of the information advantage. So, in other words, this test would find a break, would consider a break, also a situation where the coefficient goes from two to three. So the information advantage becomes stronger, right? Um, whereas the fluctuation test is instead a test for the disappearance of the information advantage. Um, so there are also other details of the Bayer Peron test that you can uh, find uh, in the paper. Okay. Now, what about the other uh, break dates? So the Bayer Peron test finds other break dates around the, the 90s and 2008. Well, there is a, we have a discussion in the paper where we link uh, some of these other dates that the Bayer Peron test finds to uh, key dates of changes in the um, central bank communication policy. And, uh, um, you can take a look at that discussion uh, and those particular uh, events. Okay, so what does this uh, analysis uh, uh, tell me? Well, this analysis sort of told me that uh, the information advantage disappeared and it disappeared around the early to mid 2000, around 2003, 2004, around the same time that the central bank started being uh, more transparent. And we've seen some talks uh, during this conference about uh, uh, the central bank communication policy, and I've learned a lot about that as well. So now, uh, given that the um, information advantage is uh, a uh, sufficient condition for the information channel, then you might expect that uh, uh, the disappearance of the information advantage might have uh, uh, might might come in tandem with a, a disappearance of the information channel. And so you might uh, expect that the information channel of monetary policy might have changed over time as well. And in fact, that's what I would like to uh, investigate next. And what I will do is that uh, I will start, I will do this analysis in two parts. And first I will investigate whether market surprises, uh, uh, sort of uh, think about these as uh, uh, monetary policy kind of shock surprises. I will be uh, expanding on this in a second. So whether these market surprises, monetary policy surprises, have information content so that whether they contain information that was known by the central bank and whether this information content has changed over time. Okay? So this goes directly to the heart of the, uh, of the information channel. Um, so what I will do is that I will revisit the empirical evidence of the information content of the market surprises 
uh, in the very nice framework by Miranda Grippino and uh, Rico, who, uh, who run this regression. So they regress uh, the uh, monetary policy shock. Okay, so here this uh, monetary policy shock or surprise is the change in the Fed fund futures, in the three month Fed fund futures, in a 30 minutes window uh, of time around the monetary policy announcements. So you look at days in which the central bank made an announcement, and then you calculate the change in the three months uh, Fed fund futures uh, data around that uh, window of time. So this is supposed that, so this is a procedure that was uh, uh, nicely proposed in a series of paper by Gorkainak and others, and it's supposed to capture uh, monetary surprises, okay? So it's a proxy for monetary policy shocks, high frequency monetary policy shocks. So this is what you have on the left-hand side. So this is the monetary policy shock, the surprise. Uh, and uh, we want to see whether monetary policy surprises have content, share content, uh, share information about the central bank, uh, share information about the central bank own private knowledge. So we will regress them onto the forecast of the central bank denoted here by FTGB and the forecast revision of the central bank. Okay, so if the central bank uh, surprises or monetary policy shock contain information that was uh, uh, knowledge of the central bank, then this coefficient should be different from zero. So we will therefore test whether this coefficient is equal to zero and again, because these data are uh, plagued by instability, we will do so by using the fluctuation test again. So what you will see in the next uh, few slides are tests whether uh, theta is equal to zero uh, at every point in time. So we will, I will show you a sequence of uh, tests over time similar to the t-test that you saw before. Uh, however, these are joint tests because we have a um, more than one coefficient here. So it will be, think of it as a walled test repeated in rolling windows over time. So this is what this picture show exactly. So this is the uh, sequence of the walled test depicted here in black. Uh, the uh, walled test here in black is implemented using the data uh, on uh, scheduled meetings, uh, scheduled FOMC meetings. Uh, sometimes the central bank communicates uh, uh, news about uh, monetary policy also outside the schedule FOMC meetings. Uh, so you can also look at all meetings uh, in this regression and those, uh, uh, those results are depicted here by the lines which, has, uh, which is blue and uh, dash dot. Okay. Um, I showed you results based on either uh, the nowcast or the one quarter ahead forecast. Uh, either uh, show you that uh, there was uh, uh, information content in market surprises uh, up until 2003, 2004, again, similar to the uh, results that you saw before, there was uh, some uh, evidence of this information content up to 2003, 2004, right? You see this black line and the blue line are outside the, uh, the um, red uh, critical value line um, and uh, uh, until 2003, 2004. And then after that, uh, there is a disappearance again of the information content. So, market surprises were significantly predictable by FOMC staff forecasts before 2003-2004, but the predictability disappeared again in the most recent period, the same period that we found before. So this is exactly what I just said, so let me skip this. So what we conclude from this analysis is that as we kind of expected, uh, the market surprises uh, stopped containing useful information regarding Fed forecasts after the Fed lost its information advantage. Now, the question that you, you know, that, that, uh, that we care about uh, as econometricians is whether this all matters for estimating the effects of monetary policy shocks, right? We are all, or most of us are in the business of estimating the effects of monetary policy shocks. So let me now then uh, investigate whether this matters for estimating, for us econometricians, estimating uh, in estimating the effects of monetary policy shocks empirically. And in fact, you would expect that uh, these results that I just showed you would matter if the information channel relies on the information advantage. So if the information advantage disappeared, then the information channel of the monetary policy might have disappeared. And this may have implication for the um, analysis of the effects of the monetary policy shocks. So I will investigate the empirical evidence on the information channel of monetary policy again 
in the very nice framework by Miranda Grippino and Rico. So what they do is that they construct a so-called information robust measure of monetary policy shocks. What is this information robust monetary policy shock? Is the component of the high frequency monetary surprises that you saw before, which is orthogonal to the Fed's own macroeconomic forecast. So what you see, uh, if you remember, if you remember the regression that you saw before, where we regressed uh, the uh, market surprises, uh, the uh, changes in the three months Fed fund future in a short window of time around monetary policy announcement, you remember we regressed the market surprises onto the information of the central bank, onto the forecast of the central bank. Well, this part here would uh, contain uh, the central bank information, if you will. And what is left is the, con the, is the uh, uh, monetary policy surprise, which is orthogonal to the central bank information set. So this is, in fact, the information robust instrument of monetary policy. So this is the surprise, the information in the surprises, which is orthogonal to what the Fed knew uh, at that point in time. So um, what uh, Miranda Grippino and Enrico do in their paper is that they propose this measure of, uh, um, um, this measure of uh, um, robust uh, monetary policy uh, surprises, and they, uh, and, and they look at uh, the effects of these uh, surprises on the, macro, uh, on the macro data, and they find that uh, the effects of uh, the robust monetary policy instrument are significantly different from those of the usual monetary policy shock. So if uh, look, using uh, the robust instrument or using uh, the raw surprises gives you very different results. So in particular, what they find that uh, what they find is that a contractionary monetary policy shock unambiguously decreases both output and inflation if you use their robust monetary policy shock, whereas if you use the usual uh, monetary policy shock, you would find uh, the wrong sign. So what we will do is that we will follow their uh, approach, we will uh, replicate their empirical analysis, but we care about time variation. So we will uh, therefore separately re-estimate the robust uh, measure of monetary policy surprises separately in the two subsamples before and after 2003, the break date that we found. And uh, I will show you input responses to these uh, monetary policy shocks estimated in uh, uh, proxy Bayesian VRs using either the raw surprises or the robust uh, measure of uh, markets of uh, um, surprises with the, the measure which is robust to the information channel of monetary policy. Okay, So I'll show you the input responses from the Bayesian uh, VR. We use a Bayesian VR because the sample is small and we want to get uh, as precise an inference as we can. Um, now, in these Bayesian VRs, you have to uh, choose some uh, tuning parameters, and we will choose them based on the uh, recommendation in a very nice paper by Janone Lenz and Primicieri. So what you will see next are exactly the impulse responses to these two types of shock, the raw surprises or the robust uh, surprises, the surprises robust to, uh, monetary policy, uh, to the monetary policy information channel. So here are the responses. So uh, I plot them uh, separately in the two subsamples. So on the left hand side, you see responses before 2003. On the right hand side, you see the responses after 2003. In each panel, you see the estimated responses. There are two uh, impulse responses in each panel. One is depicted in blue, and this is the response to the raw surprises. Uh, this is the ST that we mentioned before. The other is uh, plotted in black and is the response uh, to the robust surprises, the uh, surprises that are robust to the information channel of monetary policy. So what you see on the left-hand side uh, uh, panel is that uh, before 2003, it really, matter, uh, it really mattered whether you use the raw surprises or the robust surprises. If you use the raw surprises after a contractionary monetary policy shock, you would find an increase in industrial production. Okay? Now, however, this increase in industrial production, which is not what you should expect after a contractionary monetary policy shock, this increase in industrial production is merely an artifact of the information channel because after you clean for the information channel of monetary policy, the surprise, the, the response becomes negative. Okay? It has the expected sign. 
So a contractionary monetary policy shock is in fact contractionary. Now, this big difference does not appear there, it does not appear to be there after 2003. So after the Fed lost its information advantage, and after the, uh, the point in time in which the uh, information, uh, the information channel, that uh, after the point in time in which the uh, surprises stopped containing information from the uh, central bank, then uh, it, doesn't, it, it wouldn't really matter whether you clean the responses or not, right? As you would expect, it doesn't really matter. You would still, in both cases, you would find that, that the output decreases after a contractionary monetary policy shock. So these results uh, are robust to other variables. Uh, you can look at uh, unemployment rate, uh, same thing, uh, inflation, um, uh, etc. So uh, the, re the results are also robust to using other estimation procedure. You may say, well, Barbara, I don't really believe Bayesian VRs. Uh, well, I will tell you, look, in the paper, we also have local projections. So if you prefer, uh, the results uh, are reported there and they're telling you the same thing. Um, the results are similar if you use a schedule uh, or unscheduled meetings. Um, so at the end of the day, what we find uh, in the paper is that the information channel effects of monetary policy disappeared around exactly the same time as the information advantage. So what does it why does it matter for us econometricians? Well, it matters because uh, it tells us that uh, if you, you know, if you estimate your VR after 2003, after the disappearance of the information advantage, you don't have to worry about cleaning the surprises. Uh, these are already your clean the monetary policy shock. Before then, instead, you have to clean uh, unless, uh, uh, unless you end up, uh, if you want to avoid uh, having uh, puzzling effects, uh, estimating puzzling effects of monetary policy. So, um, I believe I might have another few minutes. Uh, let's see if Alessia complains uh, about that. You will have another five minutes, maybe. Excellent. Three. Yeah. Thank you, Alessia. So uh, I have another few minutes. So then uh, let me also show you some uh, uh, final results on the uh, original Campbell and others uh, uh, regressions. So this whole literature on the information channel of monetary policy started, uh, if you remember, from the uh, papers by Campbell and others who found that after a contractionary monetary policy shock, uh, survey estimates of uh, output and uh, GDP increase. So we then re-estimate those uh, regressions uh, using uh, these different types of monetary policy surprises. So either the uh, raw surprises uh, or the uh, cleaned surprises by Miranda Galpino Ricco. Um, in particular, we use both, in this regression, we use both the clean surprises and the defeated value, if you remember the defeated value on the information of the central bank was denoted by CD info. So we use both of them. So this coefficient beta two will tell you uh, how the uh, forecasters react to the information set of the, of the central bank. And uh, this uh, beta one will tell you how they react to the quote unquote true monetary policy shock. And we also look at the uh, MPI, which is a uh, 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 sort of a surprise in a shorter term uh, uh, Fed fund future uh, proposed by Paul and Nansford. Um, so again, mindful of instabilities, we uh, split the sample in 2003 and I will show you uh, these results. So first of all, let me show you the results in the full sample. Uh, and let me focus on uh, uh, GDP growth and interest rate forecasts. Okay, so we are regressing uh, changes in the forecast of the private sector in these two variables onto the instruments of the, uh, uh, onto the monetary policy shocks, either the raw surprises, uh, the MPI, the robust uh, monetary policy surprises by Miranda Grippino Enrico, or the fitted uh, um, component of the uh, information, based on the information set of the central bank. So uh, you see the coefficients uh, here. So when you look at the GDP growth forecast, not much is significant, right? So, um, Basically, you don't see stars, so stars denote significance. You start seeing stars when you look at the effects uh, of the uh, feel of the fitted uh, central bank information uh, uh, component. Uh, you start seeing that after a contractional monetary policy shock, survey estimate increase, right? Um, survey estimate uh, uh, sort of the expectation of GDP growth increases, but only if you look at, uh, and is significant, only if you look at the uh, 
uh, information contained in the central bank. So only if you look at the, the information channel. Okay. Now, if you look at the, just the monetary policy surprises, it, the effect is positive, but it's not significant. Uh, same uh, story if you look at interest rates. Now, this is the full sample, and uh, we care a lot about instability. So what happens if you split the sample in two parts? Now, again, there is some evidence uh, of, uh, uh, um, again, uh, um, uh, significance for the information component, but especially it, this uh, 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 significance is very strong and is very present if you look at interest rate forecasts. And if you look at these interest rate forecasts before 2003, after that, uh, there is basically nothing, okay, or very little. So again, our results uh, are similar. There is uh, less evidence that forecasted expectations react via the information channel in the most recent sample. So it all comes together. So what we find uh, in this paper is that uh, uh, we find a weak evidence or no evidence at all that the information channel is empirically relevant in the most recent period, starting 2003-2004, although, although it was important in the past. Um, the, at the same time, in the most recent period, the central bank also lost its forecasting advantage regarding the state of the economy uh, relative to market participants. So the two happened around the same point in time. And uh, this suggested that the two are uh, linked, uh, tightly linked. And we, um, um, we provided some evidence that uh, the reason why the information channel and the information advantage disappeared around 2003, 2004, is related to uh, important changes in the uh, uh, central bank communication uh, policy. So I will stop here uh, to leave enough uh, time for uh, questions and comments. So again, I thank uh, Lucia and uh, Claudio and uh, the organizers for putting together this wonderful conference and uh, allowing me to be part of it.